If you would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 2, that's where our text is going to be this morning. <clears throat> Mark, chapter 2, verses, oh, that's, that says the wrong thing. It should say 1 through 12. Ignore that slide. And it should say Mark 2, 1 through 12. I don't even know that there is a verse 22. Well, there is, but anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and read the text, and then we'll go ahead and make our observations. So uh, chapter 2, verse 1, giving you just one more minute to make your way there. It says this. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home, and many were gathered together, so that, was, so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. <clears throat> now up to this point in Mark's gospel, we've seen Jesus' authority on display through his teaching, through his miracles of healing, and through the casting out of demons. However, here in Mark chapter 2, there is a, a capping off, if you will, of the theme of Jesus' authority, and the focus of the narrative begins to shift towards something different, and I'll show you in a minute. But speaking more specifically, the theme of Jesus' authority has, that, that, that theme that has been developing throughout chapter 1 culminates in this passage with the forgiveness of the paralytic sins in verse 5. The forgiveness of sins is a blatantly messianic act, and this was not lost on the scribes who were there. Uh, they reasoned within their hearts, if you recall in response, they reasoned and said, who can forgive sins but God alone, in verse 7. Believe it or not, in the eyes of the crowds looking on, Jesus' forgiveness of the paralytic sins was the most authoritative thing that he had done yet, even more so than the healings and then the casting out of demons and all of those other things that he'd done. So the forgiveness of sins in the paralytic, uh, that was mind-blowing to them. However, the same act of authority also triggered the next phase of the narrative, and that is the opposition of the religious leaders. At this early point in the narrative, the religious leaders were reasoning in their hearts that Jesus was a blasphemer. In verse 7, we see that. But by the end of the section of the gospel, they were actively conspiring to destroy him. And what I mean to say is, is that there's a section now where the, the idea of opposition develops. It begins here in chapter 2 and verse 1. It culminates in chapter 3 and verse 6, and we'll see that over the coming weeks. But right there at the culmination in chapter 3 and verse 6, if you want to write it down, don't turn there, but look ahead later. It says that they were actively looking for ways to destroy him by the time we got to, to Mark chapter 3 and verse 6. But it began here. Now, what's interesting about this passage is that up to this point, Jesus' ministry was in a preliminary state. It was developing. It was taking shape. But here, through Jesus' clearly messianic behavior and the entrance of the opposition, we see a fuller, more complete picture of his ministry overall. That is to say, all of its components and dynamics are present in our text for the first time in his gospel. This general ministry pattern that we see in this text continues for the remainder of his earthly ministry, and it has remained throughout the church age following Jesus' ascension. And with this in mind, this account has quite a bit to teach us about why Christians are here on the earth 
and what we're supposed to be doing. Believe it or not, this little account of the healing of the paralytic has an awful lot to teach us about our whole reason for being here, why we're here, what we're doing. And so that's what we're going to unpack this morning. Um, there are four aspects of our kingdom mission that are packed into this little text, and they are very illuminating. So follow along in your outlines if you don't have them out already. And I set my clicker down somewhere. Here we go. The first aspect we see in this text of our kingdom mission is the goal. We see first the goal. Now to be clear, when I speak of our goal, I'm speaking of our purpose or why we're here or the target that we're aiming for. And I realize that when I use terms like um, purpose and goal and target, we're going to have different answers for that based upon our understanding of things. But in this text, the goal that's being communicated is the prevailing faith in Jesus. The idea of the goal communicated in this text, text is prevailing faith in Jesus, and it's illustrated, this goal is illustrated by the paralytic and his companions. They had the kind of faith that enabled them to receive what their hearts long for and more from Jesus. And how do we see their faith? We see it in their actions. Their faith was so strong that they would stop at literally nothing to get to him. They actually peeled the roof off of a house, partially, to get to Jesus. Now I realize that the roofs were, were thatch and mud and they weren't made of what they are today, but still the idea of actually tearing a portion of the roof off the house to get a person to Jesus, that's incredible. It's incredible. And that's what these guys were willing to do to get this man to Jesus. And so the paralytic and his companions are the faith heroes in this account. They set the standard that we're aiming for. So one way that we can state our goal as Christians is to encourage prevailing faith. Uh, that is to say, the kind of faith that the paralytic and his companions had. To encourage that faith in the world around us. And it stands to reason that if we're going to encourage that kind of faith in other people, we have to first have that faith ourselves, right? Makes sense. We have to have it. We can't give to others what we don't have ourselves. Now there are two qualities to prevailing faith that are worth noting. Both are seen in the way that the man removed the roof of the house to get to Jesus. I mean, that idea of removing the roof is kind of behind both of these. But first, prevailing faith has confidence in Jesus' authority and ability to respond. It has confidence. And again, that confidence is in his authority, in his power, in his ability to respond to what you need, to what you're asking for. These men genuinely believed that Jesus had the power and Jesus had the means to respond, that he had the means to help them. And this confidence drove them to do whatever it took to get to him. Nothing got in their way. They were even willing to remove the roof of a house to get to him. And if you think about it, this behavior resembles the woman with the flow of blood. I'm thinking of uh, Matthew chapter 9, uh, verse 21, where she said to herself, if I can just touch his garment, if I can just get to him and touch him, I will be healed. There was a sense of he has the power to help me and if I can just get to him, I can have it. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll press through anything. I'll do whatever it takes. I'm going to get to him. So that's what we mean by confidence. And my question to you is, is how confident are you in Christ's authority and his ability and his power to respond? Do you genuinely believe that he more than anyone else has the power to meet your needs? When you have needs, do you eagerly take them to the Lord in prayer as the one who is most able to meet them? Or do you exhaust all other options in this world first and then finally take them to God as a last resort? You know, the kind of thinking of, oh, well, couldn't hurt to pray. I've tried everything else. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to think about, but I wonder. I take personal inventory myself when I go through these things, but I wonder how often I do that sometimes. Or I've tried everything else, and now, oh, well, I might as well try praying. If that's how we approach things, then we have to ask ourselves how much confidence do we actually have in his ability and his authority and his power to be able to respond. Prevailing faith has confidence in Jesus above all else and because of this it seeks him first and it seeks him most often. And I'm not saying that you don't try the other things as well, but the first thing we do is pray. And we continually put these things in the Lord's hand first and always. Also, prevailing faith approaches Jesus with boldness. It approaches him with boldness. Again, the paralytic and his companions took the roof off of a house to get to Jesus. And there's boldness in that, you know? There's boldness in that. They didn't care about protocols. They didn't care about what was appropriate. They didn't care about what people thought of them. They just went for it. That's boldness. 
That's audacity. It's irreverent at times, but that's okay. Sometimes prevailing with Jesus involves this. Those with prevailing faith are willing to approach God with boldness because their faith is not only in his power, but they also believe in addition to his power, they also believe in his goodness and his mercifulness and his inclination in general to help them, to want to help them, that he cares about them. Prevailing faith is bold with Jesus in a similar way that a child is bold with their parents. A child knows that their parents care about them, and they know they're already loved, so they're not afraid to ask for the big things, and they ask all the time. And they're not preoccupied with proper protocol. Kids just go for it, right? They ask, and they ask, and they don't care. They just continue asking. And that's actually a good picture of the way we're supposed to approach Jesus. We're supposed to have that level of comfort to go to him. With all this in mind, do you approach God with boldness, or are you a bit sheepish sometimes about the way that you ask God for things? Do you say to yourself such things as, this is too big a request, it would be inappropriate to ask him, or this is too insignificant a thing to bother the king of the universe with, or I'm not even gonna bother to ask because I already know the answer is gonna be no, so why bother asking? The list goes on and on but these things do roll through our minds. All of these are negative presumptions about God's character and our relationship with him that quite frankly aren't true. They're not true, and they cop us out from going to him and asking him before we, you know, they cop us out before even doing it. Prevailing faith has the boldness to ask God for the big things. Prevailing faith just goes for it, regardless of the protocol, regardless of what others others might think about them, and this is the kind of faith that we need. This is the kind of faith that we're called to encourage in others as well. We need to have this and we need to encourage this kind of faith in other people, okay? This is the target. This is what we need, this is what they need. Now, that moves us on to the second aspect of the kingdom mission, which is assurance. It's our assurance. Our assurance simply means that our faith in Jesus is well placed. Our faith in Jesus is well placed. In other words, we have good reason to place our faith and our trust in him. We must have assurance of our faith in order to practice it from day to day and to preach it to the lost world. In this text, our assurance is seen in Jesus' initial response to the paralytic. In verse 5, when the paralytic was lowered down in front of him, what did he do? He forgave his sins. He forgave his sins. Now, as we saw earlier, I'm going to say it again, this was a monumental act of kingdom authority. This act communicated Jesus' identity as the Messiah more than anything else that he had done up to this point. It did so more than healings, it did so more than the casting out of demons, and it also had the effect of setting into motion the opposition to his ministry. So don't underplay what happened here. I know sometimes the tendency is to go, boy, that was lame. We were looking for him to heal, and he just forgave sins. In the eyes of the readers, this was big and it set things into motion. It was a tremendously powerful act which validated the faith of the paralytic and his companions and it assured um, them that their faith was well placed. And this act assures us that our faith today is well placed as well. And it does so in two very important ways, okay? First, it assures us that Jesus knows our needs better than we ourselves do. Fair to say? He knows what we need better than we know. The paralytic came to Jesus for temporal physical healing. He received eternal spiritual healing. Why? Again, because Jesus knows what we truly need, even better than we do. We may think we know what's best for us, but God in heaven knows better, and we can have confidence in that reality when we come to him. He knows what we need better than we do. Ask, put your needs before him, be bold, be audacious, it's fine. But at the end of the day, he knows what you need better than you do. That should be comforting. It is. Also, it assures us that Jesus gives us better than what we ask for. He gives us better than what we ask for. Again, the paralytic came to Jesus for temporal healing, but what he received was eternal spiritual healing, which was infinitely better than what he was asking for. There's that old saying, excuse me, there's that old saying, and uh, perhaps you've heard it before, be careful what you ask for, because you just might get it. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. It happens. 
I thought that was my phone for a second. It was down on the floor. I was like, oh, oh goodness, that hit vibrate. There is that old saying, be careful what you ask for because you just might get it. And there's that implication that, you know, sometimes the things that we ask for aren't for our best. But this doesn't apply with God. Jesus won't give you what you ask unless it's what's best for you. And more often than not, he will give you different from what you ask because what he's giving you is better. The forgiveness of the paralytic is a perfect example of that. Jesus knew what the paralytic needed, and he gave him that. And in the same way today, we can be assured that when we take our request to God, he will give us what's best for us even if it's different than what we initially asked for. So don't be discouraged if your prayers are not answered in the way that you ask or in the time that you ask. Instead, be assured that Jesus has something better in mind for you. I think over the years, especially as we walk with the Lord, we can look back and say, yeah, I am really glad that he answered that differently than I asked. And it proves that he knows what we need better and he knows how to give us better things. The next aspect of our kingdom mission is our adversity, and this is where it kind of gets real. Um, I think this is, again, where the text is shifting to. Um, This is an idea that emerges here and grows stronger in the coming uh, pages of Mark. But um, this was seen in the scribes, um, who in verse 7 labeled Jesus as a blasphemer. Now, we've already seen that Jesus' act of forgiving the paralytic sins triggered a hostile response in the religious leaders that continued to follow him for the rest of his earthly ministry. So from here on, wherever Jesus went, there were hostiles lurking in the crowd, looking for ways to discredit both him and his ministry. So from here on, part of the kingdom mission was the presence of adversity, which sought to discourage people from faith in Jesus Christ. Part of the job was an awareness that there was adversity there and that adversity is out there to discourage people from faith in Jesus. In other words, every time Jesus gave a reason for people to have faith in him, the adversity lurking among the crowds was there attempting to convince these same people that they should not place their faith and trust in him. The adversity was always there doing everything that it could to prevent people from believing in Jesus in the way that the paralytic and his companions did. They're trying to stop that kind of faith from happening. Remember, the faith of the paralytic and his companions is the goal. That's the target. That's what we're aiming for. With this in mind, the goal of the adversity is to prevent that kind of faith from happening. The adversity is trying to stop this faith from generating and emerging in people's hearts. And the way that they do this is by sowing doubt and suspicion in people's hearts about, <clears throat> excuse me, about Jesus. They sow doubt and suspicion in people's hearts about Jesus. Now, at this early point in the narrative, the adversity was just beginning, so they didn't state out loud what they were thinking in their hearts. But Jesus perceived it. He recognized it. Remember, he said he perceived their thoughts in his spirit. He knew what was already going on in their hearts. He perceived it. He recognized it for what it was and responded to it preemptively. So make no mistake, this is where the adversity starts forming, and Jesus recognized it for what it was, and he responded to it there. From here on, the pattern of opposition was constant, and if you read through the Gospels, you can see this over and over again. Jesus healed, and there was adversity there saying, don't believe in him. He's false. He healed on the Sabbath. Jesus cast out demons, and then there was adversity there that said, don't believe in him, he's using satanic power to drive out demons. When he taught, there was adversity there saying, he's twisting the scriptures, he's misrepresenting the scriptures, he's he's teaching them wrong. There was always there adversity lurking in the background, snipping at his heels, trying to take the people who were listening to him and watching him and trying to get them to, to suspect Jesus in a negative way or to doubt him. By the time that we get to Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, we will see, and, and that's a text that's coming up, so I don't want to steal the thunder just, just yet, but we're going to see that the opposition had become so energized that they were actively looking for ways to set Jesus up to discredit him. That isn't the only place. There's other places in the Gospels as well where they're asking him questions. They're trying to trick him. They're trying to get him to say something that they can use to discredit him. This is the way this was working by this point. Now, following Jesus' ascension to this present day, this pattern of adversity has continued. Would you believe me if I told you that? This hasn't gone away. It was there in Jesus' day. Jesus died. He rose. He ascended, left the church. We still have adversity, just like he did. 
To this day, anywhere that the gospel is going forward in truth, adversity is present, and it is there working to discourage people from faith in Jesus Christ. And part of understanding our kingdom mission is being aware of this adversity and what it looks like and how it works. Jesus, for his part, was keenly aware of it. He was so aware that he was picking it up in their hearts before they even said it. And that's why he was able to prevail in spite of it throughout his earthly ministry. And we need to be that way as well. We need to be discerning here. Now, the number one thing to realize about this adversity in the spirit of being discerning is that it's harder to spot than we might think. Why? Because it is generally a function of the religious establishment, not the lost world. Straight up, not making this up, it's true, you see it throughout the Gospels, this kind of adversity is generally a function of the religious establishment, not the lost world. The tendency is to think, oh, this is coming from them. No, it actually comes from in the religious establishment most of the time. Jesus' earthly ministry was opposed primarily by the religious leaders. They were the established and respected spiritual authorities of that day. They were the trained experts in the scriptures. They were the ones that people had continually throughout the, the generations looked to for spiritual guidance. If you were to think of it in today's terms, these were the people whose books we read on the scriptures. These are the people whose radio show we listened to, that kind of thing. This is where they came from. These respected spiritual authorities that people looked to for spiritual guidance, these were the ones, not all of them. We're not saying that all of them did, but we're saying that that opposition came from this this rank came from this area. These are the ones that were denouncing Jesus' ministry and quoting scripture even to do it. And this made it hard for people, the average person, to discern what was true and what was false. What do I believe? You know, I have Jesus here who is preaching incredible things that are resonating with me and seem true, and I have these spiritual leaders over here who are telling me it's false. And they are trained, and they, I think they know what they're talking about. So you can imagine how difficult it would be for the average person to exercise faith in Christ in the face of that adversity. And in the same way today, the adversity to Jesus' kingdom mission comes primarily from within the religious establishment. The ones working against Jesus the most are typically respected spiritual authorities who are quoting scripture in their arguments. And that's what makes it so hard, and that's why we have to be discerning. And with this in mind, There are three signs of adversity that we can watch for in ourselves and in others. And when we see these, we should watch out, regardless of how spiritual the source is and regardless of of how much scripture they quote in their arguments, okay? So three quick arguments, things to watch for. Again, the spiritual lingo is going to be there, uh, but watch these things. First, um, when you see someone labeling something that is obviously good as bad, then you're probably dealing with kingdom adversity, no matter how spiritual it sounds, no no matter how much scripture is quoted. If something that is obviously good is called bad, probably probably an issue there. And again, this happened all of the time in Jesus' earthly ministry. In John chapter five, Jesus heals a man who was crippled for 38 years. Religious leader says, that's bad. In John chapter nine, Jesus heals a man born blind his whole life blind. Jesus heals him, gives him his sight. Religious leaders, that's bad. Mark chapter, Mark chapter 3, we're going to see this coming up uh, in a few weeks. Um, there was a man with a withered hand. Jesus heals him. Religious leaders are standing there watching to see if he'll do it. And then they said, that's bad. That's wrong. Shouldn't have done that. See the issue here? Something that's obviously good, they're calling it bad. And what was their reason in all those cases? He healed on the Sabbath. He's breaking, he's violating the scripture. You see see how they're messing things up? And Jesus, for his part, in Mark Mark chapter three, is saying, is it uh, unlawful to do good on the Sabbath? He's he's like, have you guys lost your minds? This doesn't even make any sense, but that's the way that it goes. And the same thing is true today. We just need to watch for these things. Whenever you see obviously good things happen, and it's being called bad, you just need to watch. Wherever you see um, the hungry fed, wherever you see orphans and widows and refugees sheltered, wherever you see people taken care of, the disenfranchised and in need taken care of, and it's called bad for some reason, just watch out. Just be aware. Probably the opposition, okay? Also, the second sign, it's related to the first, when you see someone slandering the motives behind good deeds, then you're probably again dealing with kingdom adversity. Regardless of the scripture, regardless of how spiritual it sounds, if you have good and it's being, the, the motives, are be, motives are being slandered, probably an issue. Uh, the scriptural example, again, 
um, in Jesus' ministry. He drove out demons, uh, freeing people from the chains of that kind of bondage. People are being liberated, and the religious leaders are standing on the sidelines saying, that man is partnering with Satan to drive out demons. This is Matthew chapter 12, by the way. It says where he cast out demons by Beelzebub, for those of you who are familiar with that text. He's partnering with the devil. They're, they're in cahoots um, to deceive people. That's what they were saying. Same way today, where you see obviously good things happening, where people are, people are clothed, fed, taken care of, and while well, they're doing that for some kind of nefarious reason. Watch out. Not a good sign. Lastly, this um, is something that we can apply more to our own hearts but then we can. You can't really detect this in other people, so you have to be careful about this. You can only apply this to yourself. But uh, when, we, when, we, uh, when our actions, excuse me, are driven by feelings of threat, feelings of loss, feelings of envy, then we're probably in danger of aligning ourselves with adversity rather than kingdom mission. Um, and uh, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 27 is probably one of the examples I can think of best where Pilate, when he was dealing with the religious leaders and they're handing Jesus over, it says that Pilate could see all over their faces that they were handing Jesus over because of envy, because they were envious of him. And that's why they were doing the things that they were doing to him. And in the same way, when we feel threatened, when we're feeling a sense of loss, when we feel like we're losing things or things are being taken away from us and we're responding in self-defense, we're reacting to that, we need to watch out in our own hearts because we can be carried off by the adversity at that time. Again, these things are hard to detect. We have to be discerning because they're going to look spiritual. They're going to be couched in spiritual terms, but that's the way that it works. It happened in Jesus' day. It happens today too. So there's the adversity. Lastly, in spite of the adversity, in response to the adversity, we get back to our method, um, which is the way we carry out our purpose, all right? Uh, we are in a battle, again, against kingdom adversity. As the gospel is going forward, people are being encouraged not to put their faith and trust in Jesus for some reason. There's always opposition there. And so we're in a battle for the hearts of the lost world. And our role is to combat the opposition and to convince them that they should place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And what is our method for doing this? Quite simply, we are to testify of Jesus' faithfulness, to testify of his faithfulness. We need to speak and act in a way that communicates that Jesus does have the authority to meet their needs and to save their souls. Now, Jesus testified of himself in this text. We see it um, all the way between verses 8 and 12, but in verse 10, it's the most telling. Remember that he, he did this, he testified of himself and his authority by healing the paralytic. Um, he, healed, he forgave the paralytic. They said, he's a blasphemer. He doesn't have the authority to forgive sins. And in verse 10, if you follow along in verse 10, it says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins, but that you may know that I have the authority to do what I just did. Rise, pick up your pallet, and go home. He healed that man to testify of his authority, to testify of his faithfulness, to testify of his power and ability to do these things. Jesus did that, and it was effective. People rejoiced, and everything, every, and, and the gospel went forward and prevailed in that case against the opposition. Today, we are here for the same purpose. Christ rose, he ascended to the right hand of the Father. We're here now. Our job here on this earth is to testify in that same way. Do you follow me? That's what we're here to do. We're here to say, he has the authority to forgive sins. He has the authority to change your life. That's what we're here to do. We're here to tell them that Christ is faithful. Now sometimes, this may be done in the context of a miracle. It was in the text. Jesus healed a person. In the book of Acts, there was healings and miracles that happened all the time. And it can happen today. I'm not saying that it can't. Does it happen as much and as often? Doesn't seem to for whatever reason. And that's another debate we can have in the small groups on Wednesday. But it can happen in terms of a miracle. It can happen other ways. What's more important is that we carry ourselves and speak and act in a way that conveys confidence in our Lord and Savior. When we do that, we are saying in everything that we say and everything that we do that he is faithful and he has the authority on earth to forgive your sins, to change your life, to do everything that he claims to do. That's what we're here for. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And we push back the opposition every time that we do that. However, we partner with the opposition or we work against it when we carry ourselves in a way that shows that we don't really trust him. Think about it. Does your speech and does your actions inspire confidence in Jesus? Or does your speech 
and does your actions convey a preoccupation with all the ups and downs in the world around you? And fear and frustration and anger and hatred, whatever. What do your words and what do your actions convey? It's huge. Our job is to, f- to, to testify of his faithfulness. And that's not done just with like words once in a while. It's done with everything that we say and everything that we do. Whenever we're do- driving down the road and someone pulls out in front of us and we honk the horn and give them the one finger salute or whatever you do, uh, we are communicating to them that we don't really care about the kingdom of God. We're communicating that we're in so much of a hurry that we just don't care about other people. All those little things that we do like that communicate a lack of faith and lack of trust of, in, in Christ and his kingdom. You just, just be aware of it. It bleeds out in everything that we say and everything that we do. So we're here to encourage prevailing faith in Jesus. That's what we're here for. And we can't do this unless we have that kind of faith ourselves. So my prayer would be that not only me, but all of us here could examine our hearts and ask, you know, are my words, are my actions, are my thoughts conveying confidence in our Lord? Or am I conveying fear of what's going on in the world around me? And if there is any part of us that really isn't confident yet, my prayer would be that God would reveal it and help us to be able to overcome it so that we can do our job, which is to testify of Jesus' authority to forgive sins and to change lives. With that said, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, uh, we have a commission, we have a call, and we ask, Lord Jesus, that you'd help us to fulfill it. And we know that we need your Spirit's power to be able to say the right things and do the right things But we also need faith. We also need just a general confidence that enables us to trust in you from day to day and minute to minute. And I pray that you'd help us in that as well this morning. Father, reveal to us any areas that we're weak and strengthen us in areas that we are strong. And give us the ability and the sense of priority to communicate faith, encourage faith in other people. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing at this time, so if you want to stand and sing, mask up if you're staying. If you'd like to be dismissed, that's totally fine.